All right, everybody. Welcome to chapter 19. Um, this is maybe one of the most difficult chapters in the book, so make sure you take a, a kind of a slow look at it and you do all of the reading in the textbook. We combine um, some of the other models that we've learned in other parts of, of this course so far, and we kind of put it together into a theory of the open economy. I think it's actually one of the most interesting uh, chapters in that it kind of really explains the way exchange rates and interest rates and the market for loanable funds works um, in ways that perhaps you never thought about before. So we're going to go ahead and look for the answers to these questions. So we're going to ask, in an open economy, remember an open economy is something that is got exports and imports. Um, it's the opposite of a closed economy. We want to know, in, in these open economies, what determines the real interest rate and the real exchange rate? So remember, in this course, always the only um, variables that we really care about are real. So remember in this course, the only, the only variables we actually care about are real variables. We also study the nominal variables, but we only care about the nominal variables insofar as it tells us how much of the real product that we can, that we can get. So the, remember, the real interest rate, that is how many more real products can I buy if I put my money in the bank and I'm paid a nominal interest rate on it. At the end of the term, when I pull my money out, how many more real products can I buy than I was able to before, when, before I put it in? All right, So that's the real interest rate. The real exchange rate, remember it's, OK, so if I have the dollar value of one hamburger worth in the United States and then I go to Japan, how many hamburgers can I buy over in Japan? We're talking about it in terms of goods. Right? So nominal uh, variables are always measured in prices or numbers or something like that. Uh, real variables are always measured in products or goods. OK. And so uh, we're going to ask how the markets for loanable funds and foreign currency exchange connected. We're going to, I think this is one of the coolest parts of the chapter, is we see the interconnected, interconnectedness of these different markets um, in ways that probably we had never thought about before. Uh, we're going to see how does government budget deficits, because of the interconnectedness here, when government budget deficits ruins one of these markets, how does it affect the exchange rate and trade rate, uh, the trade balances? And then uh, how do other policies or events affect the interest rate, the exchange rate, and then the trade balance? So that's basically what we'll do uh, today in this chapter. All right, so remember that uh, last chapter we studied how net exports and net capital outflow, meaning NCO, and exchange rates, they were all connected. Remember the, the money, the, for example, if you're in a country that just is exporting, they send exports. Well, then the, the people in these countries that are buying export need dollars to pay you. So where do they get the dollars from? Well, they get them from the people sending out net capital outflow. And then when they set net capital outflow, they end up buying, um, they end up buying uh, uh, assets of the country. So we have a negative net exports in that situation, a negative NCO. Um, uh, always. It, or they're always equals, what I mean. Um, and so we're going to go ahead and uh, put some more structure on that and put another model in that and kind of see how it, the whole economy works together. All right? And then we're going to use the big model that we create in this class to see how government policies and various events affect the trade balance, the exchange rate. And, uh, and then the NCO. Okay? So let's remember the loanable funds market. So just to give you kind of a, a review, so let's start with the uh, identity for GDP. We have capital plus investment plus government spending plus net exports. Well, in the closed economy that we started out with, remember, net exports was zero. And so when net exports is equal to zero, Remember, we end up finding out that uh, if we move C and G over to this side, we have Y minus C minus G, which is equal to savings. And that's equal to investment. right? So then we took this idea that savings is always equal to investment, and we put it in what's called the market for loanable funds. So this down here is the, the quantity of loans. And this up here is the interest rate on the loans. It's the price of a loan, right? This is just a regular supply and demand curve. OK. And then we go ahead and uh, 
So once we have our, our P axis and our Q axis in the market for loanable funds, let me put this up here so you don't forget. Market for loanable funds. <clears throat> once we have that, we draw, we draw a supply curve and a demand curve in the market for loans. Now, who are the suppliers of the loans? Do you guys remember? The savers, very good. So we'll put savers, right? And so that's this guy right here. And then who are the demanders for the loanable funds? Households and firms that are going to do investing. So I'm going to put the investors. Remember, in this class, we define investing not as saving money and put it in a stock or bond or something, but investing is in the purchase of physical or human capital or something like that. Okay? So in the closed economy, the market for loanable funds looks pretty easy. However, last chapter, we went ahead and relaxed that. And we took away this assumption, right? And we allowed net exports to equal a number. Remember that? Because we opened up the economy, all right, and now we let the, the economy trade. So how does that change this identity? Well, it just adds net capital outflow onto it, all right? So basically, the new idea is every dollar that's saved in America, right, can be used for one of two things. It can either be invested in America, right, or it can be sent out to another country to be invested in that other country. And then that, would call, that would be called net capital outflow, right? Because the, the money's going out, all right? In the same way, we can think about it. If we have negative net capital outflow, like we do in um, the United States right now, that means our level of investment is higher than what our savings is. So our level of investment is, is big number. We subtract off the NCO, and that'll tell us how much savings we have. All right. So how does that change this market for loanable funds? Well, if you look at uh, the supply curve, is still still the savers, right? But the demand curve now, instead of just being investors, it's investment plus net capital outflow, right? So I'm going to put that plus NCO. All right, so, so it changes the demand curve in the market for loanable funds. OK. And uh, uh, we have this idea right here, right? It changes the demand curve in the market for loanable funds. So the reason why. Um, this market is here is, is the same exact rationale as when we originally learned it, right? The supply of loanable funds comes from the savers, and the, the, the demanders, right, the people who are demanding dollars, it can be used to finance one of two things, right? The purchase of domestic capital, that's investment in America, or it could be used to purchase the foreign asset, which is the net capital outflow, right? My capital's fly, flowing out to purchase a foreign asset. Okay? So the demand now turns into investment plus net capital outflow right here. All right. So really, we, um, we know that the savings is positively associated with the real interest rate R. Okay? Oh, I, wanted, I want to point out one thing I forgot. Uh, in the market for loanable funds, the, the price of money or the price of a loan is the real interest rate R, not the nominal interest rate. We use the letter I to indicate the nominal interest rate, right? But that's not really the price of a loan. The real price of a loan is how much difference in the real amount of products I'm going to be able to buy if I make the loan and then I get the money back at the end, right? So I'm interested in the real interest rate. Okay, so we know that the, save, the, the supply curve, the savers curve, increases as the real interest rate increases, right? That makes sense. If you offer the savers more interest rate on their money, they'll offer more loans because it, they'll be able to make more, more, uh, more money off of it, right? We know that investment is the opposite, right? Investment goes down, right? So if, if, uh, if the interest rate goes up, What's going to happen to the quantity of loans that the investors are going to want? It's going to go down, right? High interest rates are a bad thing for the investors, the people taking the loans. It's a good thing for the savers, the people who are supplying the loan, OK? But 
so this is what the old graph looked like, but now we have this NCO, the net capital outflow. So we need to graph that in here with R. And the question is, what happens to net capital outflow as R changes, right? Because the demand curve technically is no longer just I anymore. I drew it when it was just I. I need to know what NCO does to the demand curve, right? Because that's, that's the full demand curve, OK? So the question is, what happens to NCO? Well, the idea here, and this is actually pretty simple, remember R is the real interest rate on, on an asset in the United States, OK? Right? So the real return on the So R is the real return on the United States assets. So if, so if you can just think for a second, before you even look at the graph, right? we're in the United States. If the return on, say, an investment in the United States goes up, then more people are going to put their money into the United States and buy this asset. right? If the return goes down on an asset in the United States, people, instead of investing in the United States, are going to put their money where? Elsewhere. Elsewhere. Exactly. So what do you think happens? As the interest rate goes down, what happens to NCO? It goes, it, it goes up. It, it, the net capital outflow, right? We actually have more outflow, because that's what NCO stands for, the net amount of capital flowing out of the United States. So as the interest rate goes down, the, the more people move their money outside of the United States. So we get a curve that looks like this, right? If people are, are, are sending this much money outside of the United States at this interest rate, if the interest rate goes down in the United States, remember, see, R is the interest rate in the United States, right? More people send their money out of the United States. And, uh, and so the level of NCO goes up, right? So these are, so NCO in the real interest rate is negative relationship, just like the demand curve is a neg, uh, the investment is a negative relationship, right? So it actually doesn't change the demand curve at all when we add um, NCO into the investment. Okay? So the demand curve is now represented by investment and net capital outflow. And it doesn't change the demand curve really at all, because, or the shape of the demand curve, because they both have the same relationship. Right? As R goes down, the investment rate goes down, both investment goes up and net capital outflow goes up. Okay? But it gives us this kind of cool idea, and I'm going to draw this right next to it. OK. So in equilibrium in the market for loanable funds, we have this real interest rate. We have this quantity of loans, and we know that in the United States, the real interest rate on United States assets is here at R. Well, the question we might ask is, how much of the money that's being, used, that's being saved is being used in, for the investors, and how much is being sent out of the United States? Right, that's the question. And we can actually just look on this graph. We just take the interest rate, and we just run it into this graph. And this tells us how much money is being sent out of the United States, right? So from here, it's, it's, it's quite simple, actually, right? So this is, still the, this is still the real interest rate, and this is the number of dollars. OK, so this is the NCO graph, right? So we can see how much of my net capital outflow is. Let's suppose that for some reason, people started saving more money, OK? Let's suppose first that we wait for this person. Come on in. <laughs> We're waiting for you. I heard you. It's good that everybody wears flip flops. It's easy to hear when you're coming. Because <laughs> I flip my. Yeah. Then I can stop. OK, so now that we have this, this, uh, this model, so this was our model before. We've expanded it by the idea of NCO. And here's how it works let's say that everybody decides to save more money. OK? What's going to shift in this graph? Save more money. Uh, the, the saving curve will increase, right? Would move to the right. OK, so if that moves to the right, let's say it moves to here, what happens to the real interest rate? It goes down. 
Okay. So, and what happens to the quantity of loanable funds? It goes up. Okay. And so there's more loanable funds out there, but we might say, well, how much is being used for investment and how much is being used sent outside of the country, right? So with the lower interest rate, we're going to see that, boom, NCO is going to go up, right? So in other words, the idea here is the savers are providing more money to be invested. Yes, more quantity is being used for investors, but then also some of that extra money, right? Because they're sending more money for sa more saved money to be used. Some of it's being used for investment, and some of it is being used for sending outside of the country for the NCO. Okay. So basically, if S increases, yes, investment increases a little bit, but also NCO increases also. Okay. And that's how. That's how this, this thing is, that's what this is showing us, okay? So we'll play around with this new model, and we're actually going to make it even bigger in a couple of slides. It's kind of cool, but how, this, is how, this is how it works out, okay? So um, this, is, this is what I was saying. In the new market for loanable funds with the open economy, okay, because this is the first time we've buttoned down a market for loanable funds in an open economy, right? The demand curve is investment and net capital outflow. And since they both go up when the intra real interest rate goes down, we can show it on one demand curve like this. right? And the savers, the amount they save goes up as the real interest rate goes up. So we have something that looks like this. Okay? And so once again, we just have that the interest rate in equilibrium balances, uh, balances supply and demand, just exactly like I was showing you over here. OK, so let's do a practice problem where we use this new model. OK, let's do one. Let's suppose that the government runs a budget deficit. OK, so first, the budget is balanced. And what does that mean when the budget is balanced? What does that mean? What does it mean to have a balanced budget? No deficit, no There's no deficit, no surplus. It means the money they take in for taxes is the amount that they, that they spend for government spending, right? So um, now let's say so they were doing a good job, and then all of a sudden, boom, they start running a budget deficit. What does that mean? Now they run a budget deficit. You're, you're close. This is, so this isn't, a, isn't a, uh, ex, a trade deficit. This is a budget deficit. In other words, they're collecting some in taxes, but their government spending is more than what the income they get from taxes. All right, so we're just looking at the government right now. Yes, it's going to make a difference in the, in, the, in the open economy also. But just think about right now what happens for the, for the country when they start running a budget deficit. OK, so now that means that their government spending is more than their income. Where are they getting this extra money from? Right, Because they're paying out more for government spending than the taxes. Where do they get the extra money from? Loans, right? They sell government bonds. Remember we talked about this? They sell government bonds, so they give you a bond, and you send the government money, and it, and it uses it. So something's going to get messed up here. OK, something's going to get messed up here. Um, and so I want you to figure out what happens to the real interest rate, R, and the level of net capital outflow when the government starts running. Whoops, whoops, you can't look when the government starts running a budget deficit. All right? And so basically all you have to remember is remember back a couple chapters what happens in the market for loanable funds when the government runs a budget deficit. You'll change the market for loanable funds and boom, you'll have your answer. Okay? So think for a couple minutes and then we'll come back together and we'll and we'll do this. All right. So let me just check in. What happens over here? when the government starts running a budget deficit and needs to start taking loans. Do you remember? The savings shift to the left. Exactly. Because there's less, remember this is the amount of supply of saved money. Well, if the government's sucking up some of the saved money to run its budget deficit, remember that's called crowding out. It sucks up some of the money that the investors need. Well, now the investors have less money, so the supply curves are going to sh shift to the left. OK, so now that you have that, now finish the model. All right, so redraw the model. So you start like this, and then you move the supply curve, and then you shift everything, and you figure out what else happens. That's the only curve that shifts, actually. 
Okay, let's look at it. So we have the loanable funds market and the net capital outflow right here, right? Uh, when the budget deficit occurs, right? Remember what we call this is a reduction in public saving. Remember, because because if the if the government takes in more taxes but doesn't spend all of it, that's called public saving. There's extra money left that that for this for the investors to use, right? But if the government is spending more money than its income is and its taxes are income, then it's doing the opposite. It's doing public spending, public dissaving, the opposite of it, right? So the public saving goes down, national saving goes down. And the supply curve shifts to the left, right? Supply of saving goes down. The supply of savings goes down because the government's sucking up some of the savings. Money that otherwise would go to the, the investors to build factories is getting sucked up by the government. We call that the crowding out effect, right? So the, in, the real interest rate in the market for loan funds goes up because the supply is going down, right? So it means the real interest rate uh, is the same real interest rate that the net capital outflow people see. So what happens to net capital outflow? It'll go down. And why? Because the higher interest rate in the United States means that more people want to put their money into the, buy United States bonds, because you're going to get a higher interest rate on them. You're going to get a higher return, right? So the net capital, the capital starts going inflow, which means it's the opposite of NCO, right? Because And this is net capital outflow. So if it's inflowing, then that's going to go reduce net capital outflow. Okay, Does that make sense? So what happens to the real interest rate? It goes up. What happens to net capital outflow? It goes down. Okay. So this is pretty interesting. Stuff we, we may not have thought were, were related are totally related. Okay, and furthermore, you know that in equilibrium, net capital outflow always has to equal what? Do you remember from last chapter? An I about net exports, NX, right. Net capital outflow always has to equal net exports. So the government just made NCO go down, which means that also what else goes down? Net exports, which means that either our exports go down or our imports go up. Who would have thought that was related? The government running a budget deficit is being related to, to our level of exports and imports. This is really quite fascinating, the way that the macroeconomic, uh, this, the, the theory of the macroeconomic uh, model works. Okay, So remember, when you're using this uh, simple model right here, remember that the interest rate is determined here. This is where you find the interest rate, from the left graph. Okay, The loanable funds market makes the real interest rate. And then you draw it over here. Do, do, do. You draw the dotted line over to the right-hand side. And this will tell you how much capital is flowing into or out of your country. Right? And it makes complete and total sense. Right? This is the supply and the demand for loans. We have an interest rate. And then once all of the people who are willing to save money or to, you know, to send money to the, the market for loanable funds see this interest rate, either they pour it into American bonds like they did here, and NCO goes down, or they move the money outside of the, uh, the United States. Okay. So let's look at an, another market, because we kind of have ignored something. When I send money out of the United States or when I bring money into the United States, it starts as its original currency, right? And then at some point in time, it's got to be changed from its original currency into dollars and then before it's used to, to purchase United States assets, right? So there's another market going on that we just kind of ignored for a couple of slides. It's the market for, the, for currency. It's the market for dollars, but the market for dollars from other people. Right, because we're over here, and if I want to put my money in United States assets, I have to change my United Kingdom pounds, my British pounds, into dollars. So I have to find somebody who has dollars that can give me that I can give them pounds for. That's another marketplace. Okay, that's another marketplace. So let me do a quick review of how the market for the dollar works. Because we've actually already seen this once. I'm going to call this the market for dollars, but the domestic version of it. Because you've totally seen this one. 
in the United States, so don't think about the foreigners yet. I'm just going to re remind you how this market for dollars works, right? We have the quantity of dollars, and then we have the price or the value of the dollars, right? And so I'll put the value. Because anytime I have a supply and demand curve, I have the value on the y axis and then the quantity on the x axis, okay? If you remember, who is the person who supplies the US dollars for the people in America? The Fed. The Fed, right? And so remember the supply curve was straight up and down, and we called this the money supply curve, right? And the supply curve was right up and down. Who remembers what the value of a dollar is just looking inside domestic America? Do you remember what it is? It's how much of the shopping cart it could buy, right? And so we called that 1 over P, right? And as the shopping cart gets more expensive, P goes up, my dollar gets more and more worthless, right? Because as, as P goes up, this value goes down, OK? And in other words, so that's going to make a money demand curve that's downward sloping like this, right? As the shopping cart gets more expensive, that means this whole value is going to decrease. The value of the dollar is going to decrease. That means I'm going to want more dollars. That's why the money demand curve slopes down like this, right? When we're up here and the, the money is really worth a lot, I don't need that much. But when I'm down here and when the money is not that worth that much, I have to go and pull out a ton of dollar bills out of the ATM in order to buy that shopping cart or whatever it is I want to buy. So the money demand curve downward slopes. And then, like always, we go ahead and find the value of the money. So we ha find some value right here. And then the cool thing about this market was that if we, on this axis, put the price level, right, then the price level is increasing as, as we come down. And so we can also determine what the price level is going to be. So let's say that the value was 1 half here where at equilibrium. That means the price of the shopping cart was 2. OK, so that's the way that the market for dollars works inside of America. It's the exact same for the foreigners. Okay, they have. So let me do this so you know it's not. This is not part of the same model. It's just something that looks similar. Okay, so we're gonna have. We'll call it the market for the dollars, but in the foreign exchange markets. So I put forex, f o r e x, foreign exchange is an abbreviation. Okay. And so what we're going to have is the exact same thing. This axis will be the quantity of dollars bought and sold. And this is going to be the value of the dollar. But it, we're going to look at it slightly differently because this is just people inside America buying and selling dollars. This is people outside of America buying and selling dollars so that they can take them into America, remember, to buy the stocks and bonds in, in, in America. Okay? So, uh, the way we're going to understand this is that the net capital outflow is equal to net exports. Right? Net capital outflow is equal to net exports. We learned this in the last chapter. In equilibrium, this is always true. So now I want you to realize we're going to use those two things to somehow make the my market for dollars, the, the foreign exchange market for dollars. So think, think, think. If you use your economic thinking caps, right? Over here, the supply of the dollars came from the Fed, because they were actually printing them, right? But the Fed only prints dollars and puts them into the United States. How do, what's the supply of dollars for people outside of the United States? Which one of these do you think it is? NCO, right? That's by definition. The flow of dollars that goes outside the United States. That's going to be the supply curve for the people over here who want, um, who want the money, right? right? Who want the United States dollars. And then what's one's going to be the demand curve? Well, the other one up here. Net exports. And why would net exports be the demand curve? What's the, what's the other reason people need United States dollars for? 
to buy our exports. Exactly. So if we send an export abroad, they, they're they over here. So that's the United States sending me an, an export. I'm importing. I have to pay them US dollars in it. I need US dollars, right? So the idea here is that the money that's sent abroad for for whatever reason, the NCO, is, is the supply curve of dollars for people who need dollars. And this is the demand curve. This is what people are using the, the dollars for. Okay, And it's really weird because you wouldn't think that they were related at all. But it just so happens it's the same dollars <laughs> being used. So they are related. Okay, So in this market for the corn, foreign currency exchange, NX is the demand. Right, Foreigners need the dollars to buy the US net exports. And NCO is the supply. Right? The money goes out, and then people can use it. Either United States residents send the money out so that they can exchange it to buy a foreign asset. At the same time, this guy over here in the foreign country now has the dollars, and so he can go and buy a United States asset. Or he can buy a United States import, or export, I mean. Once he's got the dollars, he can buy either. All right, so let's throw this on the supply and demand curves and see what it ends up looking like, OK? So uh, first of all, we need to ask a question. Over here, the value of the dollar was how much of a shopping cart the dollar could buy. That was what we use as the definition of the value of the dollar, right? Now we have the same issue. What are we going to use for the value of the dollar, right? If you imagine in the foreign exchange world, what are dollars buying? Other currencies, right? When, when we're in the market of exchanging, right? I take my US dollars to the airport and I go to one of the currency exchangers because I'm going to Thailand. I have to buy baht, which is their currency over there. So I pull out my dollar and they're like, oh, your dollar buys, you know, I don't know how many hundred Thai baht or something like that, right? So I'm buying the dollars, right? What's that called? The rate at which my dollar buys foreign currency? The exchange rate. Exchange rate, right? Exactly. So the actual thing that's going to go on the, on, the, on the y axis, the value axis, is the real exchange rate. So let's put that up there. The value of dollars, the real exchange rate, we're going to call that E. Over here, the value of a dollar is 1 over P. It's how many shopping carts the dollar could buy. Here, it's how much of the foreign currency it could buy. Okay? So just to make this really simple, we can imagine this is just, uh, we're just the market for the dollars and Great Britain pounds. right? And so the dollar, well, let's do Japanese yen, because it's easier to kind of think about. We take a dollar and we buy 113 Japanese yen. right? So that's, that's what my, my exchange rate is. Right? So that's going to be seen as the value or, or on the y-axis. Here, it's easy. It's just the quantity of dollars, you know, the number of actual green dollar bills that are going to be, to be changed on here. Okay? So um, remember that this exchange rate we're going to use is the real exchange rate, not the nominal exchange rate, right? because we don't really care about nominals. So, even though I just told you that $1 gets changed to 113 Japanese yen, that's the nominal exchange rate. The thing that I'm really worried about for my dollar is, OK, I can take my dollar and buy a 99 cents hamburger at Carl's Jr. If I go over to Japan, how many 99 cents hamburgers from Carl's Jr. will that dollar buy? Right? They're probably not called 99 cents burgers over there anymore. Right? So I'm looking at the, the, the difference in the number of burgers that my dollar can buy. That's the real exchange rate, because that's what I really care about. OK, so let's go ahead and put the, the uh, real exchange rate on this axis. This is the value of the money. Right? This is just like I drew over here. And right here is the quantity of the dollars. Okay, so this is a market for dollars in the foreign exchange markets. Okay, so what is the demand curve? Well, remember the demand curve is net exports. This is really important to remember for the rest of the chapter. The demand curve in this market is the people for net exports, right? Now, why is it downward sloping? Well, if my E is high, that means that my dollar buys a lot of yen. 
right? I buys a lot of yen. That means when I go to buy their exports, I only need like one dollar, and I can get all kinds of yen, so I can buy all kinds of their exports, right? So when my uh, my real exchange rate is high, I need very few dollars. But then as my dollar gets weaker and weaker, and now my dollar only buys 100 yen, now my dollar only buys 50 yen, my, now my dollar only buys 10 yen, right? It goes way down. I need a ton of dollars to change into yen, right, in order to buy their exports. So that's why the demand for dollars in the foreign market is downward sloping also, right? It's the exact same reason why the demand for dollars in the domestic market is downward sloping, right? As the dollar falls in value and gets and gets worthless, I need more dollars to buy a shopping cart. As the dollar falls in value in the international currency markets, I'm going to need more and more dollars, green dollar bills, to buy whatever it is that I was wanting to buy. So the demand curve here is also downward sloping. Demand equals net exports. Okay, So it looks just like the money demand curve. Everybody see how it's actually very, very similar. You just have to remember all the new labels. You don't actually have to remember anything new. OK, now, before I show you this, what is the supply curve again? Net capital outflow, right? NCO. All right, so in the domestic market, the supply was the Federal Reserve that puts out money. And the Federal Reserve sets, OK, I'm going to put out $1,000 into the money supply. And they're not looking at the value of the dollar. Because the, the Federal Reserve is not trying to make money on us. So they're not going to like put more money out there when the dollar is worth more. right? So they just set a certain amount. And that's why it goes up and down. Now, in the foreign exchange markets, it's actually the exact same. The supply curve is just NCO, and it goes up and down. Now, why is it up and down? This, this one makes sense why it's straight up and down, because the uh, Fed uh, just puts out a certain quantity of dollars. But if I look over here, I have this supply curve that's straight up and down. Now, why, why is that? Well, these guys that are sending the money out, out NCO, the guys that are sending the money out, do so because of why. What is the decision that these people are making, whether they buy United States bonds or bonds in other countries? What are they looking at? R. R, the interest rate that I can earn on these bonds, right? If the interest rate on the bonds in the United States or any asset in the United States is high, I'm going to keep my money here in the United States and invest it here. If, if the interest rate somewhere else is high, then I'm going to uh, buy the interest rate or, or the, the investment over there, and I'm going to try to get the real interest rate, right? So the only thing that changes NCO is R, the real interest rate, right? Does the real exchange rate change R at R? Excuse me. Does the real exchange rate change NCO at all? No, right? Because they don't really care. They're actually, this is the weird part about it. Remember, the NCO people are not even in the world of the import export people. They just end up using the same dollars, right? So they don't even pay attention to each other. The NCO people are only looking at what's the interest rate I can get if I buy US government bonds, or what's the interest rate I get if I can buy Japanese government bonds, right? And then they just move it accordingly. So as the real exchange rate between the United States and Japan changes, the amount of money that goes into and out of uh, the United States for NCO is, is, doesn't change. That's why the NCO curve is straight up and down here also. All right? It's very convenient because <laughs> it has the exact same shape as the supply curve in the domestic money demand market. right? And so this is the market for, for dollars in the foreign market, and it also looks the exact same. It's very convenient that it ends up looking the same in both the foreign and the domestic markets. Okay, so, so everybody understand why this is straight up and down? We call that perfectly inelastic, right? When we talk about any of our curves being straight up and down. So basically, we go ahead and find the value of the money. In the domestic market, the value of the dollar is 1 over P. In the foreign exchange market, the value of the dollar is whatever the real exchange rate is. So that's how we find the real exchange rate E. Boom, we just, we just make the supply and the demand equal each other. right? In both of these markets, it's not really that interesting to look at the Q, because we already know what the Qs are. right? The Q here is whatever 
whatever the Fed chose, right? Fed chooses this. Whatever the Fed chooses, that's the Q, right? Normally in supply and demand, we like to look at both P and Q. But in Q, it's just going to, for, for this market, the Q is just going to be this money supply curve here. It's not that interesting. The same thing here. The Q is just going to be whatever the NCO people choose. I'll put whatever the NCO chooses. Right? It's not going to change. But the only interesting thing is to look at the value of the dollar. And in the, in the foreign exchange world, we have the, the dollar buys E, which is the number of other currencies, the amount of other currency that a dollar buys. Okay? So that's how we determine the real exchange rate, right? the real exchange rate. Last chapter, we did have this assumption that for goods that can be easily transported from one country to another and sold, remember the real exchange rate should be one to one. Right? But that's not always true, and especially it's not true in the short run. They can, it changes in the short run. Maybe in the long run, it's it, for all you know, cars or something that can be easily transported or uh, t televisions or something like that. The real exchange rate is probably pretty flat in the long run. But in the short run, it moves. And furthermore, for goods that can't be transported at all, like haircuts, it definitely moves. Now, why is the real exchange rate moving? Because of this right here. This model explains why the foreign exchange rate is, is changing, right? Because some people are supplying dollars and other people are needing to buy dollars. Does that make sense? OK. So let's um, do a little, uh, this is a, a couple of slides helping you understand if I give you a story, what, what moves over here, right? Because anytime I give you a supply and demand graph, probably at some point in time there's going to be a test and I'm going to say, Imagine that, you know, blah, blah, blah happens and people want more goods or something. And then you have to figure out which curve changes and which direction, right? And then you'll figure it out. Okay, so, so let me help you try to do that. So let's imagine that a US resident buys a bunch of imported goods. So I'm in the United States. All of these markets, by the way, are, are inside the United States and then I'm looking out, right? So I'm inside the United States. I'm buying a bunch of goods, right? What changes here? What changes here? If I need to Im import a bunch of goods, OK? So it could be net exports. But you know what? If you, think, if you think really hard, you can actually think it might be NCO. And here I'll show you how. So first of all, you might think that NCO increases because you might say, well, I need to send my dollars overseas to buy Japanese yen so that I have yen so that I can buy whatever that thing I was importing from Japan was, right? Let's say I want to import a bunch of sushi from Japan. That's what I'm doing, right? I'm importing a bunch of frozen sushi so it doesn't go bad, <laughs> right? So I'm importing sushi, but I need yen to pay the guy. So how do I get yen? Well, I, sent, I find someone else who's got yen. I give him dollars. Right? My NCO is going, I'm sending money outside of the United States. I'm getting yen for it, and then I pay the yen to the guy, and then I get, and then I get the sushi. Right? OK. So maybe the supply of dollars increases. Or maybe you can think of it as the demand for dollars increases, because remember, NX is the demand for dollars. So if I'm importing more, that means NX is going down, right? Because exports minus imports. NX is going down. So that might mean that it might be like thinking like my demand curve is going down. In other words, the, other, the reason why this is happening is because it's like NX is the net demand for dollars. As in, when I'm importing more, just in general, there are fewer people out there who are buying my exports, my net exports. Because I'm importing more, and that means my net exports is going down. And so there's less net exports I have out there, so there's l fewer people out there who need dollars to buy my smaller number of net exports. right? And so that's why the demand curve goes down. Okay. Either way, though, if you think about it, watch. If the demand curve slides like this, what's going to happen to the real exchange rate? Decrease. Decrease. If the supply of dollars goes up, what happens to the exchange rate? it goes down. 
So it doesn't really matter which way you think about it, actually, because you get the same exact answer. Okay? You get the same exact uh, idea. And Net says this. When I import more, it makes the real exchange rate go down. Okay. It makes my US dollar worth less. Now I can only buy 100 yen or, or 75 yen when I keep importing a bunch. OK? That's what that means. So really, both are, are the exact same, like I was just saying. Um, I'm going to use the second one, I, thinking about the demand for dollars. When I import, the demand for dollars decreases. Okay, I'm going to use that. But you can use this, too, if you want. It's totally fine. Now let's do the opposite case, shall we? Let's do uh, a foreigner is buying United States assets. So now we're not in the world of, of, uh, of imports and exports. We've switched to the NCO world, right? So we have a foreigner buying a US asset. Yeah. OK, so what's happening? So I'm United States, the foreigner's buying US asset. That means dollars are coming in to the United States, and somebody's buying stocks and bonds. So I have net capital inflow. So I have negative numbers on my NCO, right? So this is actually the, the exact same situation as I talked about before. Because remember, the, before when I was importing a bunch, my NX was going negative, right? It was, it was decreasing. This is actually the exact same thing that's happening, except for just from the NCO market. I had NX decreasing, now I have NCO decreasing. Right? So the idea is, what is, what is going to change here? Well, we can think about that the demand for dollars increases. Okay, Demand for dollars increases, meaning at every exchange rate, the guy needs more US dollars because he's going to buy stocks and bonds from the United States. Or I can think about it as the supply of dollars falls. OK, the supply of dollars falls. Why does the supply of dollars fall? Well, the guy's sending the dollars back to the United States to buy United States stocks and bonds. So how much supply of the dollars is there out there in the foreign world? Less, right? Because the, the, this person is sending dollars back to the United States and buying US stocks and bonds. OK. So either way, work, either way works. But um, I'm going to think about this as the supply of dollars falling. Okay. Basically, I gave you the last two slides to reiterate that when I'm thinking of the import-export world, I will think about you know, the demand curve moving. Right? When I'm looking at in the asset world, the stocks and bonds world, remember that's related, but it's the flip side of it. Then I'm going to be thinking about NCO, so I'm going to be thinking about the supply curve moving. Does that make sense? Just to kind of, just so you know which curve to shift, um, it may, it'll make it a little easier. Okay, let's go ahead and put all of these on one graph. Now this gets kind of cool. Let me show you, and kind of confusing. I can actually put all of these graphs together and make one giant model, all right? Because they all affect each other, right? We just learned about that. Up here, we're going to have the market for loanable funds. All right, let's do a real quick review of what, of what is in each piece here. We have the supply of loanable funds comes from the who? The savers. Savers, good. We have the demand for the loanable funds coming from who? Investors. Investors. And what's the other thing that in, in the open economy people might need the loanable funds for? NCO, because they can use that money. They can get a loan and send it to somewhere else to buy, to buy uh, an asset from another country. OK? We have the quantity of loanable funds here. And what's the price of a loanable fund? What's the price of a loan? R, which is the real interest rate I get on that loan, right? Here in equilibrium, it sets an R, a real interest rate, which then comes over here in this market. Now this is actually technically, I guess, not a market, but this is just a graph that helps us understand how much of these saved dollars stay in the United States as I, and how much of them get sent abroad as NCO, right? 
So we'll just call this the NCO, net capital outflow, right? And this is just downward sloping, OK? This is the amount of NCO, the quantity of dollars sent abroad. And this right here is the real exchange rate, right? OK? And so this tells us that when I have this much loanable funds and I have this real exchange rate, then let's go ahead and just kind of make this a little r so you can see. Then I come over to the NCO curve and tells us this many dollars are being sent abroad to foreign places, right? Okay. Now, I mean, any number of things could shift this curve, right? If all of a sudden the Japan looks like it's going to go bankrupt, nobody's going to want to send the dollars out there. Right to, to Japan, so that's going to make the NCO curve shift way to the left, right? But let's just just pretend that everything is good, good and fine, and the only thing that's changing is the interest rate in the United States. Well, as the interest rate goes up in the United States, I'm going to send less money abroad. As the interest rate goes down in the United States, I'm going to send more money to Japan, right? And then, don't forget this level of these dollars that are get sending that get sent outside of the United States becomes the supply curve for the people from Japan who want to buy dollars, right? This is really cool. So it comes down here. And this is the supply curve for, let me write this. This is the market for dollars, but in the foreign exchange, right? These are the, these are the, the people in the Japanese people who want to buy US dollars, right? Their supply curve is just the amount of NCO that we're sending over there, the amount of dollars we're sending over there. Right? And so down here, we have the quantity of green dollar bills that are being, uh, that are being traded. And over here, we have the value of the dollars. And in the foreign exchange world, what's the value of a US dollar? E, the real exchange rate. OK? I guess I should point out that in previous chapters, we had used little e for the nominal exchange rate, right? So remember, little e is just the nominal exchange rate, this one. That's the nominal exchange rate. And then capital E is the real exchange rate, OK? And then finally, the very last thing that we can find out is there's got to be a demand curve, because this is a market, right? This is a market. So there's a demand curve. And who are the people who are demanding dollars? The people who are buying our exports. OK, the people who are buying our exports. So from there, we set a real exchange rate. OK, does that make sense? So wow, <laughs> we have a triple model going on here. It's all connected, right? So when the United States government runs a budget deficit, what's going to happen to all of the things, right? So a, a couple things are going to happen. That's kind of that's the question that I want to ask, right? So let's imagine that we have, you know, the government budget is balanced and the trade is balanced and, and, and everything is just like this. Okay? But what happens when the government runs a budget deficit? So we did the top half of this already, right? We did the top half of this already. When the government runs a budget deficit, supply of, of loanable funds decreases. So R rises, and that makes NCO fall. Now I want you to know, and I want to know what happens to the real exchange rate, E, and then also the balance of trade, the trade deficit. Or does it become a trade deficit or a trade surplus? OK. So what I need you to do is I need you to draw this the supermodel, the triple model here. At first, I need you like this, and then I need you to maybe in a different color pen, shift whatever curve needs to be shifted. It's the S curve. It's the supply of savings. And then do, 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 do. Come through and figure out what else happens. OK? And also tell me what happens to the balance of trade. All right? So you go ahead and do that. All right. So what happens? We are in initial equilibrium. Everything's good, and the budget is balanced. And then the government starts spending too much money. United States government starts spending too much money. We have a budget deficit. So what changes in our supermodel? Ah, supermodel. 
Supply curve falls, exactly. And that makes R rise, right? Which comes over here, right? And the NCO curve is not moving because like people aren't scared of putting money in Japan or anything like that. It's it's fine. So that means that the NCO decreases, right? Because this went up, so the NCO decreases. So that means that the supply of dollar bills in the rest of the world, what does it do? Falls. It falls, which what does that do to the real exchange rate? It's like it rise, rises the real exchange rate, OK? So that's good. So we've, we've answered this part of the question. Now you kind of have to use your economic thinking, because I don't have a model for this part. What happens to the balance of trade? Imagine that we're in America, and our dollar is getting more and more expensive, meaning we can buy more and more yen, Japanese yen, right? So what happens? I was able to buy only 100 yen, and now I can buy 150 yen. Now I can buy 200 yen. So American consumers do what? buy a lot of Japanese imports, right? Because they can buy all kinds of Japanese imports, right? So the imports goes up. What happens? How many exports do Japanese people buy from us? For them, right, the $1 used to only cost 100. But now the dollar is costing 200. Now the dollar is costing 300 yen. Gosh, I can't afford these US dollars anymore. So do they buy US goods? No, no right? So exports go down. Imports go up, and we know that exports minus imports is equal to nx, right? So if this number gets smaller and this number gets bigger, this gets more negative, right? And that's called a trade deficit. So look at this. The budget deficit. This is kind of crazy, right? Who knew this is all connected? The budget deficit made people send money into America, which made less dollars out there in the regular world, which made the dollars that were out there cost more, which made the exchange rate go up, which means that people in other countries can't afford our exports, but we sure can afford their imports, right? And so the, the, the trade deficit happens. The budget deficit causes a trade deficit, right? So this is a quite a surprising, I think, outcome, especially since a lot of people pay attention to the fact that we import more than we export. And why is this a problem? Don't forget, when we're exporting goods and we're, or excuse me, when we're importing more than we export, that's basically we're loaning from the rest of the world, right? We're borrowing from the rest of the world. The United States is the most in debt nation, remember? And I have it on an, a later slide. It's about $4 trillion we owe to the rest of the world. Because every time that we buy an import, but we don't send out an export to the rest of the world, basically we're, we're taking a loan from the rest of the world to pay for that import, right? And so, People spend a lot of time trying to worry about, worrying about this, saying, oh my goodness, our imports are too high. Our exports are too low. How can we you know, encourage people to, to export more? How can we encourage people not to import stuff, but buy American? So you see all of these kind of ideas, like, oh, you got to buy American, and you got to you know, not buy from foreign countries. And the, I, don't, I don't think that anybody realizes, well, this is my opinion, why, what causes that, OK? What causes this, this trade deficit problem? Budget deficit. The budget deficit. Nobody, nobody thinks about that. Nobody thinks about that, right? This is really quite fascinating. Um, the fact that we don't save enough money. <laughs> we don't save enough money, and that causes our import and exports to be out of whack. It's pretty weird. It's pretty weird. Not a lot of people think about that. It's my personal opinion of why, why it happens. Okay? So basically, there we go. That's just this little bottom piece here. I didn't have room to fit all of it on the, on the graph, right? So it reduces net exports. Net exports goes down, and it's negative, OK? Um, and since net exports was right, it was, a, it was at 0 initially. Now it causes a trade deficit. All right. So you see that this is actually true. If we pull the data, 
we realize that when the United States has a big budget deficit, right? So this means that in, a, in one year, this is not the total US debt. Remember the difference between the deficit and the debt? The deficit is just how much we, how many more loans that the government takes out each year, and then it all gets added into this giant number called the debt, right? So I'm just looking at the deficit right now. Okay, I'm just looking at the deficit. Each year, when, for example, this is at about 4%, when in this year, the United States government spent 4% more than it took in on a GDP scale, right? So 4%. Look at what happened to the net exports. They were down negative, right? And now, why is that happening? Well, because of this really crazy model, right? When the United States government is spending more than it, than it takes in, it needs to borrow money from the, other, the rest of the world. Well, in order to borrow money, it borrows dollars. But the guy out here doesn't have dollars. He has Japanese yen. So he has to change the dollar. Find, what does he have to do? Find somebody who wants yen and gives him dollars so he can give them to the United States. So this guy over here has a bunch of extra yen with which that he's going to um, pay the exporter here to ship the imports to America, right? So it's kind of this, this long uh, process. But you can see that when the United States government runs a balanced budget, our, our net exports are way closer, right? And then lately, how's the government been doing with the budget deficits? <laughs> really bad, right? And what's that caused our trade deficit? Really negative. You see that, how negative that is? Okay. So they do, I mean, not exactly perfectly run together because obviously the flows of money take some time to catch up with each other. But in general, they seem to, they seem to be pretty much matched and opposite, right? Matched and opposite. Okay. So um, before I get to this, I want to draw you just one more time kind of the the picture of what happens with these dollars. I'll draw you the picture that goes with the supermodel here. OK, so we have the country US. And we have the country, let's call it Japan. All right, see if I can do this without messing up. So. Uh, the, we're going to do this from the, the perspective of the United States. Okay? So let's suppose that we have a really bad trade deficit. Our trade deficit, we actually don't export anything to make this as simple as possible. All we do is import. Okay? Well, we import. Now, I'm going to need to pay these Japanese guys in yen, but I only have dollars here. Right? So what am I going to do? I'm going to send dollars out to, I'm going to put some guy right here. We'll call this the market for currency exchange. I'm going to send him dollars. He's going to send me back yen. Right? And then I'm going to take these yen. OK, so this is the importer exporter guy. I'm going to take these yen that he sent me, and I'm going to pay the yen back to this guy to pay for those imports, right? Well, now what happens? This guy has a lot of dollars, OK? And then when the United States needs, um, they're going to need money. So we'll do some guy in the NCO world. This guy, these dollars that I sent, this guy, uh-huh, here's what's going to happen, sorry. So now there's all these yen here in Japan. I think that's the sign for yen, right? Because that's, that's the imports, and then the dollars, and then the yen, and then the yen come here. So the yen are here. Now they get traded inside of Japan, and you know, because it's the nat natural currency. Then some guy ends up with a bunch of yen. And what is he going to do? He wants to take these yen and buy some US stocks and bonds, because we know that the US needs extra money because they have a trade deficit going on right now. Okay, So he sends the yen back to this guy and buys what? Dollar. The dollars. So he sends the yen. He buys the dollars back. And this guy sends the dollars back to the NCO place. 
I mean, the NCO world, the, it's the financial sector, really. And then we send them back. What does he buy? Stocks and bonds. OK, so here's the picture of what's going on, right? There's the market for loanable funds. There's the market for um, dollars on the foreign exchange market right here, right? And then there's the import-export market in green. Okay, so you see the kind of complex flow that's going on here. But you'll notice a couple of things. All of this craziness is just financial markets. Basically, in other words, when they send us imports, at the end of the day, we pay for it with what? Stocks and bonds, right? In other words, that's a debt. We're sending them our, our, our debt, right? So we're going into debt for these people. And um, what is the other thing that's interesting about this? Oh, I think that's about, that's about it. So that's kind of the picture that goes with the, the triple model. All right. So uh, now we go back to that, uh, the budget deficit uh, problem that I had the, the, the triple model up here. What happens? National savings falls when the United States runs a budget deficit. The real interest rate rises. Domestic and investment and net capital outflow both fall, right? Because there's just not enough dollars in there because the United States is crowding it out. The real exchange rate appreciates and net exports fall because goods in the United States get worth more. Okay. So it's kind of a confusing uh, connection, right? But if you look at it a couple of times, and maybe you can watch this video again or something like that, you'll kind of understand, I think, a little bit better what's going on. And if you can draw this picture, I think that you're going to be, uh, you're going to be good. If you can draw that picture, you'll understand, um, I think, what's going on. Okay. So uh, this is the, the part why I was drawing the picture, is to show you this. As as we, as we uh, get more indebted to the rest of the world, as we get more imports, uh, the country's debt to the rest of the world increases, right? So basically, the import problem, we're importing more, we're paying them with stocks and bonds, we're get growing in debt to the rest of the world. So remember I showed you guys this last chapter. Because every year that we have a budget deficit, it makes us have a trade deficit. And so the trade deficits keep increasing every single year. So every year we owe the rest of the world, I don't know, maybe another $800 million or something like that. Right? Well, it keeps adding up, adding up, adding up. We owe the rest of the world about $4.2 trillion. Right? That's a lot of money. Um, what is this graph? Well, US people own about $21.6 trillion of other countries, but other countries own about 25.8 trillion of us, so that's not balanced, so it's about 4.2 trillion dollars. Right now, not a big problem because the um, interest rate that we pay on this on this money is lower than the interest rate that we get from other countries, right? Because the United States is generally less risky, and so the interest rate we pay on our loans is lower because we're a more credit worthy nation. So they about cancel out. So we actually don't end up having to pay any actual interest on this debt, which is, which is good. <laughs> but if anything changes and we end up having to pay interest on this debt, this could really start sucking up all of our GDP, right? A lot of it. All right. So um, here's just kind of the left-hand side of the model. Remember that anything that increases the interest rate, the real interest rate, Whatever it is, right? I could have, oh, I don't have the model over here. But you know, I could have a change in the supply or a change in the demand for the real interest rate. Anything that does that is also going to change NCO, right? And so when NCO changes, the supply of dollars in the foreign exchange market will change. And then the real exchange rate will also change, right? So anything that changes the real interest rate will immediately, well, not immediately, will, but, but eventually change the real interest rate through this model. All right, so remember that the loanable funds mark, here's the way to use this, the super model, right? Here's the way to use the super model. The loanable funds market determines the interest rate, right? 
The interest rate determines, I guess I should put some labels on this. This is the NCO. NCO. Determines the NCO. And then the value of the NCO determines the exchange rate. This is vulnerable funds. Yeah. OK. This is the market for dollars in the foreign exchange. All right, so that's the way to use the supermodel. Generally, you start here, and then you come down here. Sometimes I might give you an example, and I have one in the slides a little later. If something happens and it scares people, or, or maybe it makes them even want to send their NCO overseas, their, their money outside of the country, even when the, the interest rate does not change, that would change this graph, but most of the changes happen here in this guy. OK. OK. Um, before I start this, I want to draw that uh, the money circulating picture again for everybody and for the, the online students, uh, just so we know exactly kind of what's happening in this this supermodel. So let's just do this again. This is the United States. This is Japan. Um, let's imagine a world with a, a really serious trade deficit. So that means we're only importing. So we send the Im they send us the imports. Well, the United States needs to pay for these imports. The guy who gets them, he pays in dollars. But at some point in time, and there's got to be a money changer. So let's call this uh, the market for foreign exchange. OK. There's got to be some money changer. He changes the dollars into yen. right? So he had yen, and now he only has dollars, because he got dollars. But then he gave, oops, he doesn't pay the guy. He sends the yen back to this guy to use. And this guy sends the yen to Japan to pay, right? And that's how he ends up paying for the imports, right? Now, the yen, they're in the Japanese economy. And maybe the, the exporter here, he you know, pays rent or goes out to dinner or whatever. The yen float through the economy, and they end up in the finance sector, OK? So there's yen over here. Now, we know the United States, because they have a trade deficit, they also have some sort of a budget deficit. They, they, need, they need funds. So this guy wants to send funds to the United States, but he's got yen. So what does he do? He sends it back to the money changer, to the foreign exchange market. And remember, this guy, he got the dollar from the, in the export world. He got the dollars and sent the yen, right? So what he, does he have now? He has dollars. So he sends him yen. This guy sends the dollars back, OK? Then he sends the dollars to the financial sector of the United States. And then the United States pays back with stocks and bonds. Okay, Stocks and bonds. So now uh, everything is, this guy now has yen again. So for the next time that this export thing has to change, everything's ready to be reset. I mean, everything got reset, right? Because now this guy has yen again. So the next guy who sends him dollars, he's going to have yen to pay for him, right? So you see that the dollars that were paid for the exports, for the imports, yeah, Japan was exporting. The dollars that were paid for the imports are the exact same dollars. They go to the money changer, then they go over here, then they come back to the United States, right? And then the capital is outflow, OK? So we have net capital outflow paid for by the exact same dollars, right, that, the, that the, this guy paid for the exports, all right? Or for the imports, sorry. It's an import from Japan. So this is how, even though these two worlds right, are very different, this is the import-export world, right? and this is the financial world. Even though these two worlds are very different, they you operate using the exact same dollar bills, which is why NX and NCO are the same on, on both sides. Okay, So in other words, right? 
when we get imports and we don't have any exports to pay for them, right? The preferred way to import is to, you know, import something and then export the same amount so that you pay for it, right? But if not, if you import without sending any exports, the only way you can pay is by getting in debt, sending away stocks and bonds, okay? So this is the money diagram uh, that I think makes this a lot easier to understand, okay? Now, let's, let's draw the supermodel back up here. All right, so we have the market for loanable funds. We have the demand curve that is both investment and NCO. We have the supply curve, that's the savers. We have a quantity of loans, and we have a price of loans, that's the interest rate. This equilibrium determines an equilibrium interest rate and an equilibrium quantity of loans. Now, if we look at the NCO world, we ask how much of this saved money that was, that was loaned out stays in the United States for investment and how much goes out to the rest of the world? Well, it determines on the interest rate, right? The real interest rate. So we have this R, level of NCOs going down. So at this equilibrium interest rate, this much money is sent outside of the United States. This is the market for dollars, but in the foreign exchange world. And so these dollars that are sent out become the supply curve for dollars. And so we're going to say supply, we'll call that NCO. The demand curve is NX, right? This gives us. Um, by the way, these, this is the quantity of dollars, and this is the value of dollars, which we call the real exchange rate. And this sets some sort of equilibrium real exchange rate. Um, you know, I, I think it's, it's important to say that when the real exchange rate goes up, I think sometimes people think, oh, yeah, the dollar is getting stronger against other countries, right? But really, what just ends up happening, right? It makes American goods too expensive for the rest of the world. It makes other goods seem like they're cheaper. We buy more imports, thus further indebting ourselves to the rest of the world, right? Whereas if the exchange, the real exchange rate falls, a lot of people think, oh no, the dollar is losing power. But really, I don't know about that. When the real exchange rate falls, what happens? That means American goods are now cheaper for the rest of the world, so more people are buying our products. That's good. Our productivity in the United States is going up, which is excellent, and it makes everything in America cheaper to other foreign countries. So that means like foreigners can come and vacation in the United States and be tourists in the United States, spend all their money in the United States, right? And it, I think it really perhaps having a low interest, low real exchange rate actually benefits the country. Okay, and we'll see, and I have a couple of examples of countries, specifically China, that on purpose keep their exchange rate too low so that we want, as Americans, we want to buy more and more Chinese stuff. And that's one of the reasons why China has had such huge economic growth, right? Because they, they've got this concept <laughs> that if we, you know, make our exchange rate low, it's actually better for the country, okay? But before we get to that, I want to uh, spend, well, most of the rest of this class is just going to be moving the supermodel around, OK? Moving the, the triple model. Because uh, I know it's kind of confusing, but I want to give us practice using it. OK, so let's suppose the government provides new tax incentives to encourage investment. So let's just say something like it tells investors, hey, uh, companies, if you take some money and you invest, you don't have to pay taxes on it, or your taxes are decreased, or something that makes companies want to invest more. All right? So, what's that going to do to the real interest rate, net capital outflow, the real exchange rate, and then the balance of trade? Okay? So, the same thing again. Draw the supermodel in equilibrium just like this. Okay? Then figure out what's going to change here. Something's going to change here because the government is telling people to invest, right? And then when all that happens, follow it through and see what goes on. OK? And we'll, and we'll come back together. 
OK. Let's think. When the government provides new tax incentives to encourage investment, how does what changes first in the supermodel? What's the first thing that changes? The supply curve increases. So the demand increases, right? Because think about this. The supply curve are the savers, the, the, the households that are saving extra money at the end of the day, right? I don't really care what the government is doing uh, tax policy with the companies. It doesn't change my saving habits at all. But what it does change is the investing habits of the firms, right? All of a sudden, they want to invest. So the demand curve increases, right, up to here. Now that's going to make the interest rate go up. That's going to make the level of NCO go down, right? NCO goes down, this goes up, which means the supply of dollars in the foreign market is less, which means the real interest rate, E prime, goes up, OK? So this is actually really similar to the situation that we just had when we had a budget deficit, remember? The only difference was instead of the supply curve going up, we had the, uh, excuse me, instead of the demand curve going up, we had the supply curve going down. Uh, the big difference here is the quantity of loans Q increases in this situation. Whereas in the other situation where the supply curve moved back, the quantity of loans decreased. But everything else is the same as the budget deficit, right? So. Here's the, the demand going up, interest rate goes up, NCO goes down, then we come down, and the real exchange rate goes up. It appreciates. Oh, and I forgot. What does it do to the trade balance? Trade deficit. It makes a trade deficit, right? It reduces net exports. It makes net exports more negative, right? Which is kind of a bummer, really, uh, for the country as a whole. However, I mean, we have more. We have more investment. And remember, what is this investment stuff? This is like building factories and stuff like that. So I mean, this is, this is good investment, right? It's going to make us a better, stronger country in the future, OK? So I want to compare the two scenarios, right? We had one case where all this stuff happened because of the budget deficit, right? And then I gave you another problem where all this stuff happened because the investment was increased, right? So let's compare the two. So really. It's interesting to note that the, the increase in d investment is the same as the budget deficit in a lot of ways, right? R rises, NCO falls, uh, E rises, net exports falls. But the big difference is the quantity of loans made, right? Investment tax increase, or the, the, sorry, the investment incentives, the tax incentives, increases investment, which increases productivity, growth, and living standards in the long run. The budget deficit. May, remember it made the, the supply curve come back? That actually made the equilibrium value of Q decrease, which is going to reduce productivity in the long run. Right? So even though we have about all of the other, all of the other same exact things, the, um, the investment incentive is much better for the country because now we have a bunch more productive investments. You know, maybe people built more factories. They got these loans and they built. They bought tractors, so now they can farm more land or something like that. Okay. All right. Let's think about uh, some trade policies now. Now that we have this market set up, we can think about some things that people typically say. So, anytime this this general thing called a trade policy is when the government tries to influence the imports and exports directly. Right? We know that the government can influence, by running a budget deficit, it can influence all of this stuff, and it can influence the net exports. But if the, if the government looks and says, OK, I want you to try to do more exports or more imports or something like that, we call that trade policy. So there are some examples. There's a tariff. This happens quite frequently. Uh, there's a tax on imported goods, okay. uh, an import quota is a limit on the quantity of imports. And there's these things called voluntary export restrictions. <laughs> it's when one country 
uses political pressure to tell this country, no, you can't ship any more to us than 100,000 units or something like that. Okay, it's very, it's the exact same thing as the import quota, really. They're like, we don't want you to send us more than 100,000 goods. Boom. So why do people do this? Well, I mean, this, it's, it's basically because they don't understand this model here. But this is alive and well in the United States. And the idea here is, let me give you an example. So uh, Japanese cars, for a, for a number of years, had a big time import quotas, right? Japanese car makers made better cars, and they are cheaper, and they're more fuel efficient uh, than American car producers, right? And then Japan started you know, exporting cars to us, and we started importing their cars, and we loved them, and we kept buying more of them. But then what did the domestic car companies think? Oh, no, they're running us out of business. We have to compete with these imports, right? So they lobby the United States government to put an import quota on the cars. We can't have any more than you know, 1,000 Japanese cars coming in every year or something. I don't know what the numbers are. But the, the idea was to try to save the United States industries. Okay, by forcing Japan not to be able to sell the cars. All right? Already, if you start to think about that, we know that we're going to end up with something bad, right? Because the consumers in the United States were trying, I mean, nobody was forcing the consumers in the United States to buy Japanese cars. They preferred them because they were smaller and more compact and better made and last longer, right? To this day, people, like, if they want a car that's going to last a long time, look for a Toyota, right? Or something like that, or a Honda, okay? Um, of course, that upset the, the US car makers who had crappier cars, but they wanted to try to preserve their, their uh, market share, right? So they pressured the United States government to, to pass this law. So what, did that, what does this do to the, to, uh, to the country as a whole? Well, uh, first of all, what are the, what are the reasons uh, that, that people restrict imports? This is the one I just said, right? Save jobs in the, in the domestic industry that has difficulty competing with imports. Right? So the American cars are just not as good as Japanese cars. People want Japanese cars. And so the American car companies, instead of making better cars, what did they do? They decided to lobby the government to force Japan not to be able to send cars to us. OK? Um, some people maybe even have a better idea. They're like, dude, if we have this trade deficit problem, right? we're importing too much. So if we make imports, restrict imports, then uh, we'll fix this trade deficit problem, right? Which is maybe a good idea, but it shows me that people aren't understanding why the trade deficit happens. It's because of budget deficits over here that the trade deficit happens, all right? So we're going to say, do these work, right? And what happens to the economy as a whole? So let's go ahead and use the supermodel to look at what happens when we try to put in these um, these trade policies, OK? So we're going to do the, uh, the example that I gave you guys. There was a quota on cars from Japan to try to save jobs in the United States car maker industries, OK? So we're going to start uh, in, in, the top, in the loanable funds, right, market. Now, this is interesting. So an import quota, does it technically do anything in the loanable funds market? No, right? Exactly. This is like the financial side of things, right? We got the savers, we got the, the demanders that have investment. They don't really care. Nothing happens here, OK? And it, therefore, it doesn't affect uh, um, net capital outflow, because net capital outflow is just you know, savings minus investment. OK. But what it does affect is, uh, oh, so OK, so the supply curve does not change. But what it does affect is the demand curve down here. OK, in the market for foreign currency exchange. So here's the idea. At every level of exchange rate, no matter what it is, so say we were here at equilibrium first, right? If I stop imports, what's that going to make net exports do? Increase. It's going to increase, right? So net exports are going to increase because the demand curve is net, net exports, right? But the supply of dollars is not changing. So even though the, the, the demand curve shifted out, there's not this many dollars. So we have to climb back along the demand curve until we get back into equilibrium to here. You see what happens? 
the equilibrium went out to here, and then it goes up, and so it ends up back here. Uh, because uh, there's not, there's just the supply curve, the number of dollars doesn't change. So all this did was what? Raised the, the, the real interest rate. Excuse me. All it did was raise the equilibrium real exchange rate, not the interest rate, sorry. Okay. So what ends up happening to net exports? Nothing. Right? Now come back here, right? The idea here was people were like, no, we're going to stop imports so that net exports is better, right? Well, they, they tried, but we can't be over here because that's not an intersection of the points. It has to, the exchange rate has to go back up here, which means that US goods got way more expensive. So even though we stopped the imports of the, of the Japanese cars, the, the exchange rate went up, and we just started importing from every other angle <laughs> of, the, of, of the world, right? Yeah, we couldn't import the Japanese cars anymore, but that made the exchange rate go up, which makes all the other countries' stuff cheaper to us, and we just buy all the other stuff, and they can't buy any of our stuff. So the net exports get, goes back to where it was. It doesn't even change, right? It doesn't change at all. So um, right? if, if, if the E could remain at that original E1, the net exports would rise, and the quantity of dollars demanded would rise. But NCO doesn't change, so the quantity of dollars is fixed, so we just go up to the new equilibrium. Right? Since because NX must equal NCO, because they're the same number of dollars that are being used, uh, net exports keep, stays to its original level. Right? So the policy of restricting imports, what did it do to help us with our trade deficit? Nothing. Right? Which is to be expected, because where do trade deficits start? In the market for loanable funds, as crazy as it sounds. right? That's my opinion, that, that uh, trade deficits start in the market for loanable funds. Again, I want to go through what happens here. So we try to stop imports in a certain sector so that our net exports will go up. Well, the problem is there's not enough US dollars to go around since NCO doesn't change. So that just makes our exchange rate go up. So even though that we stopped ex importing from this sector, we start importing from all the other sectors even more, and we put net exports back where it started. right? So you can't change the level of net exports by trying to manually force you know, the exports or the imports to change. It doesn't, it doesn't work. Okay? And let's see what happens for the jobs, right? Because that, maybe that's the, the, the real reason that people were trying to um, keep the Japanese cars out of the United States is because they wanted the, the automakers, the people to buy the automakers in the United States, right? Well, it definitely is for sure a fact that there's fewer Japanese cars in the United States because that's the law, right? And so it is true that US consumers buy more US autos, right? OK. So that is true that US automakers hire more workers to produce these cars. And so it's true. The policy does save jobs in the US auto industry. However, there's other things that are going on. Don't forget. Because the real exchange rate rose, right, when we did this? OK. So the real exchange rate rises. What does that mean? That means that we can't sell exports to anyone anymore because our real exchange rate is too high. So when I'm in another country, I'm looking at American goods, I'm like, no, these are too expensive. I can't buy them. So that means that all of the factories that used to make stuff and sell it overseas, guess what? They all went out of business. All right. So the export industries contract. The exporting firms lay off all their workers. And it destroys the entire export industry. OK? So the idea here is that it saves jobs in the auto industry, but it destroys jobs in the export industry. Right? So let's do a kind of final review on what do import quotas do? Do they help with the net exports problem at all? No. Does it save the car industry? Yes. But does it destroy another industry? The export industry. And I want you to think about something. Which jobs did we actually really want to save? <laughs> the export jobs or the car making jobs? Well, let's think through. Right? Before the import quota happened, 
we knew that were the American cars good or better than Japanese cars or were the Japanese cars better? Clearly the Japanese cars were better because that's why people, no one was forcing the US people to buy Japanese cars. We know that the Japanese cars were better, right? So what cars do we actually want on the road? The Japanese cars. We don't want the American cars, right? And on the flip side, I know that the firms that were exporting stuff, they were exporting, they were more productive because Someone in another country is like, oh, this American good is better than the one that I can buy in my country, so I'm going to buy it. So what jobs do we actually really want to, to save are the exporting industry jobs, because I know they're the most productive. The car jobs are going out of business on themselves because they're least productive. The jobs that I actually want to eliminate in America are these low productivity car jobs, auto jobs, right? And so this import quota actually flips and destroys the actual, the exact jobs that we want to save, right? It, 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 it destroys those, okay? So that's, that's, that's one, one, uh, one way to, to analyze it, okay? Let's do another example. All right, so we're going to switch gears here. So we're going to talk about capital flows from China. So what, what has China been doing lately? Well. China sells a lot of goods to the United States, the exports, right? And in order to do that, China wants to keep its real exchange rate low on purpose so that it's easy and cheap for us to buy, right? OK, so if you imagine, what do they have to do? Well, they have to keep the dollar high and the, and the Chinese yuan low, right? Which means that, how do you do that? They have to buy up extra dollars if they're out there to make them scarce so the demand, so the supply is low, right? So the price of a US dollar is high. And then they have to flood the market with Chinese yuan, and they're not rare anymore, right? So there's a lot of them out there. So this is basically what the Chinese government does, right? It buys up US dollars. Um, and so it has accumulated the US, US assets. Now, what happens in the United States? Well, that means the dollar is high. Relative to Chinese RMB, I don't know if you guys know this. This is like the uh, the slang, not slang term, but like the other term for Chinese uh, currency, right? You know how like in America we have dollars, but sometimes we call it bucks. You know, like seven bucks. Like this is like this is bucks <laughs> for Chinese people. R RMB. Um, okay, and. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, with my, my dollar buys a lot, so I can buy a lot of product from China. Well, that's great for China. It's a booming industry. Like, they're loving it. <laughs> they're like these suckers over here. They're just buying up all our stuff, right? And what is that doing? That makes uh, the US have the big trade deficit, right? People over in China, they're so smart. So we have the big trade deficit. We're actually going into debt to China every single year, right? Because we're importing more than we're exporting, right? And so there are some US politicians that want China to stop, <laughs> right? And so they're, what do they say? They're like, oh, we're going to restrict trade with China in order to make them stop, right? That's, that's what some people say. And, and really, I mean, in my opinion, this thing that, that Chinese, the Chinese government does is brilliant for them. It is quite hurtful in the United States, but it's brilliant for them, OK? Um, but the, uh, it's, it's possible that by restricting trade with China, it's going to, I mean, all of the stuff the United States people want is, buy, is, is from China, right? Like we, we buy our iPhones and our computers and everything from China. So we don't really want this to happen. And it's not really 100% sure what the effect of Chinese uh, currency intervention has, right? Some people think it's bigger, some people think it's smaller. It's not exactly true. OK, so that's one thing that China does. Let's talk about what happens if you have um, political instability in a country, meaning like it's maybe the country's going to go under, right? So in 1994, uh, it, there was a lot of political inst instability in Mexico. So what did that do? It made people really nervous about investing in Mexican companies or Mexican stocks and bonds, right? Because it looked like 
1994, perhaps, so the Mexican government, and a lot of Central American governments have this history where they go in and what's called uh, nationalize assets. So basically, they, if you have a really nice big company, the government comes in and takes it over, and, and they just kind of take it from you. Okay? That's, uh, that's, that's, for example, the uh, Mexican government, many years back now, went in and uh, nationalized all of the uh, gas industry, the petroleum industry, right? So now the, United States, or the Mexican government owns every gas station and every petroleum exporting facility in the entire country of Mexico because they went in and, and they just grabbed them all for themselves. Right? So people all of a sudden, do they want to be owners of firms in Mexico? Do they want to buy stocks and bonds from people in Mexico? No, because they're afraid that the United Mexican government is going to come in and, and purchase them up, right? So what did everybody do? NCO into Mexico or NCO out of Mexico? <laughs> out of Mexico, right? They pulled their capital out of Mexico. And this is called capital flight. When everybody takes their money and moves it out of a country really quick. It's called capital flight. All right, and we're going to use our, our supermodel to analyze this, but we're going to be, we're going to pretend that we're Mexico. We're not going to pretend we're the United States like normal. We're going to pretend we're Mexico when we run the model. Okay, so we're going to have the market for loanable funds in Mexico, the NCO in Mexico, the market for Mexican pesos in, loan, in, the, in the foreign exchange market. Okay, so we're going to just convert everything to Mexico. All right, so we're going to go ahead and analyze this using our model, but we're going to, be, we're going to pretend that we're Mexico. All right, so we're in the, the market for loanable funds in Mexico, the net capital outflow from Mexico, and then this guy right here will be the market for Mexican pesos in foreign exchange. Okay, so what happens? Well, foreign investors sell their assets and pull their capital out, right? So I know that that means that... For every value, for every interest rate that Mexico can offer me, right, I want to move my money out. I, I, don't, I don't really care. So at this level of, of interest rate, do I want to have this level of NCO anymore? No, I want to move my level out. I want to move money out. So my NCO is going to increase. Does that make sense? So nothing actually happens in the market for loanable funds at first. The thing that happens is that, that the net capital outflow increases, right? Money starts flowing out, OK? All of a sudden, I'm scared to put my money in Mexico. Boop. I just, my net capital outflow increases. Does that make sense? For every level of, of interest rate right, that they, that they can offer me. OK, so what does that do? Well, that's going to mean that uh, the increase in NCO increases the demand for loanable funds. Because don't forget, this demand is investment plus NCO. All right, so this one's a little weird. It starts here in this part, okay? And then it goes back and it increases the loanable funds. Well, what does that do to the interest rate? Increases, increases the interest rate, yeah? And so think about it. We're in Mexico right now, and all of a sudden people start taking their money and putting it in America. There's no money left to make loans in Mexico. So that, that means the interest rate for the loans is going to go really high because people are demanding it, but there are no, is no money for the loans. So the loans are going to end up costing a lot. In other words, the interest rate is going to go up a lot. Okay? So that's, that, so that's what happens there, right? People move their money out. Well, I know the demand is curve in the market for loanable funds is both investment plus NCO because I can send my money overseas. So now all of a sudden people are moving their money out. There's no money left in Mexico to make loans. So the loans that are made are, are going to be are going to be really expensive. Okay? So the interest rate goes up. The uh, NCO goes up. Let's see what that happens down here in this part. So when the NCO goes up, that's going to make the value of the peso do what? Fall. Okay? The value of the peso will fall. Right? Not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, when the peso falls, that means everybody starts buying more Mexican imports. Right? I, I want to buy, buy more from Mexico. I want to go on vacation now to Cancun more because it's cheaper. So people start pouring a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of money into, into Mexico. Right? Um, and so we know that 
when capital flight happens, all of a sudden, phew, the exchange rate drops. Right? And so you see this. This was US dollar. How, many, how much did, if you had one peso, like, how's this, how's this? One peso would buy how much US dollars? It used to buy almost 0.3 US dollars. Then all of a sudden, a peso whew, fell, and it was buying 0.2 US dollars. And then it was only buying 0.15 US dollars, right? So it's halved. Right? In other words, everything that a Mexican wanted to buy from the United States just got twice as, much, twice as expensive overnight, right? So it's kind of a bummer for Mexican consumers, because <laughs> all the stuff they were buying originally from America, they can no longer do that, OK? And this was a very short time frame. Look, we're talking about October 23rd, November 12th, December 2nd. This is by two weeks, right? And then all of a sudden, December 22nd, phew, this is just a couple days it felt like this. In other words, people moved like half of their money from Mexico. So we're talking about billions and billions of dollars within just a couple days right before Christmas here. They moved all their money out. Yeah, Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Mexico. Exactly. Right? Huge amounts of money. OK, so that was Mexico. Uh, same exact thing happened in Southeast Asia. In 1997, we had uh, the Asian financial crisis. This is the worst crisis that Asia has ever had. Now, what happened was um, all of these countries, South Korea there with their won, Thailand with their bot, and the rupiah in Indonesia, what they did was they didn't want the US dollar and the South Korean won to change. Right? They wanted to keep the same exchange rate all the time. I guess they didn't understand this thing. <laughs> right? Or for whatever reason, people like the stability of always having you know, $1 be 20 South Korean won, right? for whatever. They, they wanted it to happen. Well, we know that the, the exchange rate naturally wants to, ch to change all by itself. So what's the only way to keep them locked in? Well, if the United States dollar starts creeping up and getting more expensive, what do you do? You buy up, you use American dollars to buy up some of your own currency, right? So you put American dollars out there, it makes American dollars cheaper. You buy up some of your own currency, and it makes your currency go up, right? So it, it, if the American dollar starts creeping up, you just bring it back. And they have to do that every day. Well, what happens? After a long time of the American dollar trying to creep up, right, and then them spending all their American dollar, spending American dollars to buy up their own currency to keep it level, you get to the end, of the end of, I don't know, a year or two, and you don't have any US dollars left in your bank account. And guess what that happened, right? It happened for all of these countries, actually, at a very similar time. So this, is, this happened much slower than the Mexico one, but it still definitely happened, right? So the first thing that fell, which was the first one to fall? Thai, right? You see the blue guys fall? They ran out of US dollars. Because what they were doing was they were using the US dollars to buy up their Thai bot to try to keep them level, right? Because the US dollar was trying to get higher, and, but they would, they would try to bring it down. And so when they ran out of dollars, guess what happened? Boop! It started going, going apart. Well, what are you going to do if you had money in Thailand? At first, it was trading like this. But then all of a sudden, and you have money in Thailand, all of a sudden, the, the Thai dollar just starts depreciating and gets worthless. Do you want to keep your money in Thailand anymore? No. no. What are you going to do? You're going to pull your money out and put it in somewhere in America. Right? Otherwise, if you, own, you know, have something in Thailand, then Thailand becomes the Thai bot becomes worthless. Your money just went away. Right? So everybody pulls their money out of Thailand, which what, what happens? That makes <laughs> their currency fall even more. Right? The very thing that people are afraid of is the currency falling. So they pull the money out, and it makes the currency fall. Right? It's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right? They're scared their currency is going to fall, so they pull it out, and it makes it fall. Well, so that happened to Thailand. And then the next one to fall was the Indonesian rupiah. They also ran out of US dollars. And finally, the South Korean won was the last one that was, uh, had its exchange rate pegged. And it ran out of US dollars, too. And it fell. And so um, they recovered pretty quickly. But this was called the Southeast Asian Financial Crisis. And it was all because they were trying to keep their exchange rates pegged. Instead of just allowing them to float, right? They used up all their US dollars. They had no more US dollars. The entire country had no more US dollars left to, to buy up um, their currency. Okay? So what happened there? And you see that the, the currency, excuse me, the capital flew out of Southeast Asia. And the 
exchange rate fell. Exactly like we would predict, right? Exactly like we would predict. When the NCO, you know, people start moving their money out, the uh, exchange rate falls. Okay? Russia in 1998, they, uh, let's see, what did Russia do in 1988? They um, privatized all of their companies. So the opposite of Mexico. They had state owned companies and then they sold them to private citizens for ridiculously low rates. And so it, it made the um, Russia be very unstable. Um, and then, of course, everybody started pulling their money out of Russia. Same thing. OK? Same idea. Um, Argentina in 2002. So they, for a long time, were pegged one to one with the US dollar. Right? So they had their Argentinian dollar was exactly the same as the US dollar. And how would they achieve that? They would just, you know, if the dollar started creeping up, they would just use, they had a lot of US dollars, and they would buy Argentinian dollars and pay for with US dollars. Um, but then Argentina has really big debts. Well, it kind of, word got around that Argentina was going to stop paying its debts <laughs> to the rest of the world. So what is, how do you think that people who are you know, loaning money to Argentina are going to feel? Probably not so good. So everybody sucked their money out of Argentina. And look, it just, it just bombed Argentina. This is the worst of all of them. It was trading at one to one. An Argentinian dollar bought one US dollar. But then, at the end, an Argentinian dollar bought only like a, a US quarter, right? 0.2 something dollars, right? It fell almost by five times, right? So this was uh, a, big, a big bummer for Argentinian consumers because all of a sudden they can't afford imports from any other country because every other country, their, their money got so much more worthless it made everybody else's currency look really expensive to them, OK? And so that was in 2002. So basically. Uh, NCO increasing, exchange rate decreases, right? So the United States economy is becoming more and more open. Remember, nowadays we buy our imports are almost 20% of our GDP, so it's quite high, right? Um, it's, rating, it, it's rising um, relative to our GDP. And also, people hold stocks and bonds from other countries more often now than ever. Um, in their, in, and the firms get money from other countries very often. Okay, so basically, um, we have this trade deficit problem because the money, the we're buying too many imports, but we can't blame this on the international economy. What's the cause, according to me? What's the cause of a trade deficit? Budget deficit. A budget deficit, right? I don't think that it's caused by unfair trade practices like China stockpiling all the US dollars, which they do, and it's a genius for them and good for them. But that's not what's causing our trade deficit. If we didn't have a too low savings rate, if we didn't have a budget deficit, it wouldn't matter if they stored up all of our, of our dollars, because we would still have a, an equal trade deficit. I mean, we'd have a trade balance if we had a balanced budget. Okay, so. Um, the fact that we're not growing in the United States that fast is not because there's all these cheap uh, products coming in from other countries. It's because we have too low savings, we have too low investment in the United States, and so we don't have very high productivity growth. Okay, so hopefully keep these in mind, right? I know that in 10 years you're not going to remember how to use the supermodel, but in 10 years remember that the reason why our trade deficit is happening is because we have a budget deficit. We don't have big enough savings, right? Because you're going to hear politicians for the rest of your life talk about how we need to you know, keep those other countries out, and we need to only buy American goods, and that's the only way to make American economy strong, stuff like that. And I just want you to remember, not the exact supermodel, but the idea, <laughs> right? OK. All right, any questions? <laughs>